Hey, before we get going, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, eToro. Let's talk about trading. Maybe your MO is just stacking sats once a week, or you're one of those cowboy altcoin traders who go deep into technical analysis. I don't know. Maybe you're just a muggle and you're trying to get into this whole cyber cash thing. Maybe you actually do want to put some skin in the game, but you have no idea where to begin. Now there's one trading app for all of that, eToro. It's a trading platform and mobile app that lets you buy and sell cryptocurrency. And it's also the number one social trading platform in the world. Listeners, you might even be asking, what the hell is a social trading platform? Copy trading is a feature that lets you mirror the actions of top traders on the platform. This way, you can learn about due diligence and all the other technical things it might take months to pick up on your own just by copying the behavior of the top traders on the platform. So head over to eToro.com and get started on your portfolio today. eToro, smart crypto trading made easy. Greetings, you listener. It's 2020. This is the Bitcoin Magazine podcast, and I'm Dave Hollerith. Today, I've got an interview with Kiara Bickers. She's the author of Bitcoin Clarity. Bitcoin Clarity is a book that sets out to explain the how, what, and why of Bitcoin but it does so from the perspective of systems thinking. Basically, what this means is that Kiera sets out to take a holistic approach to analyze all the different parts of Bitcoin and explain each of them in the context of the network as a whole. I can honestly say the book is one of the clearest, best things I read about Bitcoin. She talks about how we approximate decentralization, how Bitcoin acts as a decentralized clock, and when information is and isn't valuable to understanding Bitcoin. And like her book, Kiera just brings a lot of perspective. I think a lot of us miss when we're, you know, in the trenches every day, like trying to learn about this stuff. So anyway, here's my interview with Kiera Bickers. Yeah, so I I wanted to write a sci-fi book and I had all the characters planned out and I just got so, I moved away from San Francisco. So I felt that I was too close to tech, like everything was tech in San Francisco and I just needed a break. I moved to Chicago, I continued to work at Blockstream remotely and I spent basically eight hours a day, every day writing this sci-fi book. And I never I never finished it, but it's definitely on the do, to-do list to get back to it at some <laughs> point in my life. <laughs> hey, I've got one of those. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure we all do. Yeah. <laughs> all the side projects that you know we put down and never pick up again. But it was just too hard and painful to watch what was going on in the Bitcoin space and or the cryptocurrency space at large in like 2017. Yeah, because there was so much noise, mm-hmm. and I had so much knowledge about Bitcoin that I felt was undocumented. And you know, it it ended up being that I felt that writing Bitcoin Clarity at that time was more valuable than writing a fiction book. <laughs> That but I will sense. definitely go back to it at some point. Yeah, I mean, fiction is fiction is totally a labor of love. You know, like nobody uh, cares about that. You have to assume, you know what I mean? Or at least I do when I put, put it out in the world, just because it's so hard to get fiction that's read. Yeah, I mean, when you actually, because now I know way too much about self-publishing, but, you know, mm. if you look at the fiction writers that do self-publishing, they end up, the only way they can make it work is if they write a series and then they give the first book in the series for free. And it ends up being, you know, not to be overly judgmental, which is sort of my nature, but uh, it ends up being like very low quality, like in a very specific genre. If you write anything that is in multiple genres, people aren't interested. Like if you write something that's too new, people won't know if they like it. Uh, And then you have the Harry Potter thing where it's like, oh my God, well, of course, people get lucky. (laughs) Yeah, I've definitely noticed that. Like Self-publishing is like, I mean, it makes so much sense, you know, but at the same time, there's still, it seems like there are gatekeepers to where if you want to get your book recognized, you have to have the gatekeepers sort of like pass it. Yeah. I mean, like you're on Twitter, right? And the whole way, yeah. the way that Twitter works is sort of the way, I guess, a lot of media works in general is that the only way that you can rise up in Twitter is if someone with more clout than you pulls you up, right? So it's like, if you get a retweet from someone who's got like a hundred thousand followers, you'll get some in that process. But unless, unless short of that, unless you have a network that's like, rooting for you and has more followers than you, you you get no traction. And it works the same way in publishing, right? Unless you know someone who can bring you traffic, you get nothing. Yeah. 
Speaking of networks, so your, your Bitcoin book, Bitcoin Clarity, is different from other Bitcoin books that I've read. On the initial level, it's because you take a different approach. Can you sort of explain that? It's about systems? Yeah. So first of all, it's really nice to hear other people say that it's different than other Bitcoin books. Because for a long time, I was thinking that. Like for the year that I spent writing it, I was like, this is different. This is different. But to actually get it into people's hands and be like, oh, wow, that is actually different. I feel a little bit validated in that way. So why is it different, right? Well, my background is working at Blockstream, at least for the past like four years now. And Mm -hmm. it's really a lot of technical developers there. I mean, it was a lot of Bitcoin core developers since then a lot of them have left, but the conversations were so cypherpunk, so like protocol level, like it was all about systems all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it took me a while to really understand the way they think. But once I felt that I got that down, I started to see how they were perhaps having blind spots. Yeah. So what I wanted to do and like what validated the idea that there were blind spots is they all were willing to admit it, right? They're like, oh yeah, like we don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about soft skills. Or like uh, when you look at things like mastering Bitcoin, it's, it very much reads like the Bitcoin wiki. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you have something to Google, if you want to learn about UTXOs or something, you, it gives you a very like micro, like a very small understanding of these concepts, but you're missing the whole ecosystem, which those concepts evolve. So yeah. what I wanted to do with Bitcoin Clarity is in, like I wanted to basically regurgitate the way I think, which is I think within context all the time, right? So I think visually more than verbally. So mm-hmm. everything is illustrated. And mm-hmm. then I think in terms of the structure in which every concept evolves. So when you're talking about blockchains, you sort of have to talk about cypherpunks. When you're talking about decentralization, you have to talk about like why decentralization was hard to achieve for developers. And once you have that understanding, it gives you the same level of appreciation that someone who's been in the industry for 10 years and struggled to build these systems themselves because you understand how long it took to get there and what the intellectual hurdles were. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense of how you structured the book because you you put um, markets and sort of like the idea of, of trading or interest in Bitcoin. You put that all at the end. Right. Right. And this goes back to me starting to write it in like 2018, 2017-ish. What was everyone talking about at that time? Well, it was the price, right? And like, that's all anyone talked about. And I, I would hear stories of people go, like I went to a bar and like ended up getting into a conversation with someone about Bitcoin and Ethereum. Someone sold their house and bought Ethereum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, it, it's, I, I didn't know that those were real people. And then I started to meet them on a day-to-day basis at that time period. I was like, this is nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is, this is so not, because, you know, when you're, if you were in Bitcoin in 2012 or earlier, or maybe even 14 and earlier, it was very much a builder community. Like, what can you contribute? What can you build? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And all contributions were sort of shared in the network and like, it was all appreciated and there was this camaraderie and that really melted down by the time we got to 2017. So yeah, it's just been a weird, it's been a weird journey, but that is why I put markets at the end because I felt that so many people focus on markets because that's ultimately what you want to know. Like again, when I started doing stuff in a, in Blockstream, no one ever talked about the price, but then externally that's all anyone talks about. So there was this huge discrepancy where Yes, obviously the price matters because that's why we're interested in in assets in the first place, but it it was never what drew me in initially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, it does at first strike me as a book for beginners. If you don't know anything about Bitcoin, you can pick this up and it's extremely helpful. Um, Anyone who already knows a lot or has spent time in the space can also pick it up and get a pretty strong refresher and some clarity around a lot of, there we go, uh, around a lot of <laughs> topics. Um, but I was curious about, it seems to me like you're not targeting investors as much. So um, I turned the whole thing into a video series as well, because it turns out people who buy books aren't the same people who want like one-on-one help. And totally. it's, I've seen a lot more interest in investors and like people who have trading and are sort of like, uh, I'm tired of trading. Can I get some help understanding what the hell I'm actually trying to do? Like those type of people are interested in, in videos and we'll pay more for it. But people who are interested in books, originally it was targeted for beginners. But like you said, basically I tried to make it interesting to anyone who's been in the Bitcoin space also. Like Mm -hmm. 
I try and drop historical references that you wouldn't really know unless you were there. Yeah. And, you know, just because someone was in Bitcoin since 20 whatever, like for 10 years or however long, doesn't necessarily mean they remember all of that happened. Yeah. You know, sometimes you're head down working on a project and then like you miss sort of what's going on that year. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of a good example. Oh, China banned Bitcoin again. Something yeah. like that. But that's kind of irrelevant. Um, uh, can can you think of a, another historical example that you that you mentioned, like Segwit? I mean, I, I know you bring up. I talked like, a little bit about Segwit. Like I talked only only a little bit. Um, that's a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, I guess there was one miner. I, I'm trying to think of what miner it was. That was like, was it Bitfear? I can't remember, and I don't want to throw the wrong person under the bus. Yeah. But there was basically some miner that everyone was ordering stuff from, and then it turns out they're like, oh, it's delayed, it's delayed, it's delayed. Then if you read, it's all in the in the footnotes of the book, so it's not in the body. But if you read in the footnotes, it talks about how when they were actually when the government actually came storming into them, they made signs to mock their consumer. It was like they had these little hand puppets that like said like, why you no ship. And it was like all a joke about how they were taking they were taking consumers' money to supposedly ship out miners, but then they were using the miners before they shipped them. So yeah, yeah, I I remember that. I'm I'm not gonna uh, drop the company name because I'm not positive about it either. Yeah, but. I can't remember anymore. So it's like, I it's 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 all documented somewhere. A lot of this stuff that I wrote about had to be referenced from like forums. Yeah, at the time, like yeah. Bitcoin Talk or something. Uh huh. Yeah, it's funny. It, not just in Bitcoin, like in general, all these like new histories of things that are being created since the internet. It's like the history is being documented on forums, basically. Yeah, it's actually quite a shame. It's it's quite a shame that I mean, I'm sort of guilty of this too. I'm sure it's documented somewhere, but then people don't take the time to read the history, and then like every generation has their own new technology, and they don't know the ones that came before it. So yeah. I guess what I'm guilty of is I recently just started re reading about Visa. Uh -huh. And the guy who created Visa is such a boss. Like the dude created this trillion dollar company and the similarities between what he was trying to create with Visa and federated blockchains will like blow your mind. Cause really? what he was actually trying to do is create a consortium where no one, in, one bank in specific controlled it. And yeah. you know, he was able to achieve that. And after he quit working at, uh, as a CEO of Visa, he just like moved to the wilderness and wrote like basically tweets, but in a book. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And it, it's like, I had no idea the history. So, you know, we're all guilty of this. I think what, when I got into Bitcoin, I remember telling some like OG who ended up hiring me and becoming my boss that I had never heard of PGP. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it was created the year I was born, you know? So there's this weird thing where you learn about technologies backwards. Totally. It's really insane when you think about it from people entering Bitcoin because having no conception of economics or something like that, or, or yeah, even just like how all the parts of Bitcoin were created through like, I mean, I, I guess, you know, you could go back to like 80s and 70s for uh, encryption or yeah, encryption, but like 90s, like all the different parts, proof of work. Right. And then there were like patents on something. So you actually couldn't use the tools even though they existed. Yeah. What was that? It's Merkle trees. Yeah, Merkle trees. So he, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh, not open source. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like you have to have to realize that, like in the internet, it's application developers that make all the money, and protocol developers like are broke. Yeah. Right, and and that's it, it's definitely not that way in Bitcoin because they buy the token, but it's not a direct payment system. It's not like they're getting paid to work on their cryptocurrency. They just bought it. Like anyone could do it. Totally. So, yeah, it's a little bit messed up. <laughs> um, so you used to work at Blockstream. Uh, I still do. Uh, yeah, okay. I wasn't sure of that. Okay. Yeah. So what do you do for Blockstream? Yeah, so um, I started out there as like the first intern and then they hired me. Nice. I think because I just kept ranting about Bitcoin and wouldn't go away. And then, yeah, I always joke about it. But yeah, uh, I worked there as a system administrator. So it's like keeping all the computers nice and on. That makes sense with your systems approach to the book. So I want to just like dive into specific sections of the book. One section that I really liked, did a really good job of explaining decentralization, uh, was the section on actually approximating decentralization. And you name the factors that dictate the scale of decentralization of a system. And the two I was most interested in are immutability and network cost. 
So basic argument about decentralization is that it's probably the most important property on the blockchain and uh -huh. other properties emerge from it like censorship resistance, right? So we really want decentralization. The problem when it comes to the way we think about things we really, really want is we believe that if we can't measure it, we can't maximize it. This is very flawed and dangerous thinking because once you try to measure decentralization, uh, it's a bit, I relate it to security, right? Like you can't put a, a quantifiable number on how secure your house is. You can't say it's yeah. like 100% secure or 50% secure. You can only make generalizations or relative statements. So like a relative statement is, what were the two examples you gave? Uh, network costs and immutability were the ones I was, I was interested in. Oh, okay. Yeah. So network cost is one way that you can sort of measure the decentralization, how, how much it costs to run a full node. Yeah. And then also immutability is something that sort of varies based on how decentralized you are. Right. So like if you're very decentralized, it should be immutable. If you're, if, as you push more towards, de as you push more towards centralization, you get, you know, you get censorship, which is totally what the, this is the opposite point of what decentralization is trying to achieve. Yeah. And you, you mentioned that you like didn't include it in the original scale immutability that is because it's so similar to censorship resistance, I guess, or just censorship in general. So it's interesting that you point out how costly decentralized systems can be. Can you sort of give me an understanding of like reasons why? I mean, essentially it's proof of work as an example is costly. So right. not every system needs a proof of work mechanism. Can you give me an example of like something that should definitely not be decentralized and then something that maybe Bitcoin or outside of Bitcoin that, that should be decentralized? Cool. Okay. So my, I'll, I'll put my belief out here on the table and it's definitely something that's debatable. Like if, yeah. if, if I am hit with new information, I would change this belief. But it, currently my belief is that decentralization is really, really hard yeah. and that Currency is the killer app for blockchains. Everyone wants to put everything on a blockchain, or at least that was sort of what the past two years have been, right? And I think people are sort of wising up to this because of how difficult it is to put things on a blockchain, being that it's immutable. Like imagine trying to update protocol stuff while you're in this, this decentralized environment and getting all the nodes to upgrade. And then it's just, it's just a mess. Mm -hmm. So an example of a bad idea, <laughs> which would be like trying to put Uber on the blockchain, right? And to me, like, even dare I say putting social media on a blockchain would probably I've I've gone back and forth on this because I'm so like I would love a platform that was censorship resistant but the problem is is moderation a form of of censorship self-moderation so let's say you delete a tweet did you just self-censor you know like you, mm -hmm. you can't do that in a mutable context yeah right it's like you want payments to be irreversible until you want them to be reversible so like how many times have you made a payment and say like okay this is the first time i'm working with this contractor i'm gonna pay them but if they don't deliver i'm sucking my funds back yeah this is like the heart of immutability that you pointed out it was the fact that this is kind of the first time in history that we have a digital record that cannot be changed at all right uh, and that's potentially actually very dangerous if we're yeah. overly naive about it. Yeah. And you say that like, we probably have not realized the full implications of that. Can you sort of unpack that a little bit more? Okay. So we mentioned that I wanted to write fiction, right? So, <laughs> so I think in very sort of like futuristic dystopian ways. And I think also that's just an exercise of adversarial thinking over the long term. So bit, blockchain, Bitcoin is relatively new. It's very clear that the market doesn't understand it because most of the people don't do simple things. If they understood it, they would do simple things like not reuse addresses. They would take their funds out of an exchange. The vast majority of traders, not necessarily Bitcoiners or people who are in the crypto ecosystem, but just traders are not holding the underlying asset and they don't really care what it is. Right. But, you know, China exists and they're a country that is very totalitarian or maybe authentic authoritarian is a sort of less extreme way to phrase it since they did they do have some capitalist tendencies yeah. but if you look at things that smarter people than me are saying so when i look at like elon musk talking about ai he talks about how if you assume any rate of of growth of technology any rate of improvement eventually you will get a computer that's smarter than a human right and if you allow immutable systems to sort of coexist in this environment, you're giving an opportunity for data to live forever in this environment where we no longer control what's being created. If that, you know, there's oh just so God. many different <laughs> things I could say. Yeah. Right? And I, when I in in Blockstream, even we're having a lunch, just like a casual lunch, and 
I'm, I'm not going to name which guy said this, but it, it, he's, he's a good guy and it was really funny, but he just said it so casually. He, it was a developer who said, oh yeah, in the future we'll have, we'll have land that's basically controlled by the decentralized AI. So of course there's nothing that could go wrong there. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't even want voting to be digital. <laughs> like, <laughs> how would land be controlled by a decentralized AI? Like, how would that work? So there'd be a decentralized AI that you could not. I guess stop. the more interesting question is, how could it not? If this is the direction that we're going in, right? Where it's right. like, you know, oh yeah, you can like I think about the blockchain or as Bitcoin as digital land already in some way. Yeah, right? you're just trading back these little parcels on this register. Now, I have really tried to wrap my head around tokenized assets because. You know, and this is an unpopular thing, I think, that's in the book. But I don't understand how, you know, okay, with Bitcoin, the value is in the blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. We're transferring Bitcoins on the blockchain. I send you money, you send me money, and that's all UTXOs and this history that's linked together. And once we start saying, okay, this thing on the blockchain represents this. Yeah. I don't know how you do that, right? Because all I can say is I don't think it represents that anymore. But if you have, like you know, some swarm of drone controlled AIs, then you just enforce it. <laughs> you just, you just do what the government does. You enforce your policy with force. Oh my God. Right. And so it's like, I mean, I'm not going to live when that time comes around, but people will wise up to what blockchains actually are. Like right now we're still in the hype phase. People are still understanding, but people who have been in this industry for as long as it's existed, they know what it is, you know, and certainly people who like, I used to go to events in New York and stuff and just see how there's kind of like an arrogance at larger companies like Intel and stuff. But now they actually understand it. Whereas before, I think everyone was just sort of like talking about it. We need a blockchain. <laughs> right. My blockchain. I think it's now it's like, oh, my blockchain. <laughs> it's like, so, they know what it's know not this. good for now. Uh, decentralized uh, AI controlling land. I That is absurd real quick question about the title so i could be completely wrong here but is that a reference to uh zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance no i read that no. book and it bored me to death unfortunately ah. no i wanted to write so one of my favorite books up here is called beauty the value of values it's like no one's ever heard of it it's written by some guy out of like ut austin and he like writes poetry or whatever but he makes this really uh, elegant case for the necessity of beauty and i saw that I saw that the way he saw the world and everything about his, his mental models reflected the way core developers see Bitcoin. They look at this system as something that's elegant and, and simple, and like that's what makes it so compelling. Yeah, so I wanted to title it Bitcoin, the Value of Beauty, but I thought that was a little too feminine. <laughs> so I was mm -hmm. like, great, a female writes a book about Bitcoin and she's just like right, ranting about beauty, like how... How, how niche, but no, I ended up deciding to call it Bitcoin Clarity, mostly because that's how I felt as I was writing it. I was like, finally, like Bitcoin without the hype. When we met at the Bitcoin 2019 conference, which was six months ago, the main thing you had talked to me about that you were trying to explain was the trustless time chain yeah. section. And, and that seems like that gets into what you're, you're bringing up about a lot of the developers and that they see Bitcoin in a very different way than most people see Bitcoin. Because they have to, otherwise they'll yeah. break it. <laughs> like, yeah. And, you know, I, I can't claim to know how necessarily how developers think in, in all ways, but certainly no, they're totally. doing something that they view as potentially risky, right? Like if the state were to decide that this thing should be illegal, like they're taking a huge risk in putting their neck out there to be uh, public about who they are and what they're doing. So, you know, I have a, I have a lot of ad admiration for, for developers and certainly the, there's a huge delta between my level of knowledge and their level of knowledge. I think what I'm trying to do in the book is take what little I've learned over lunches and like late night phone calls <laughs> and like tried to turn it in something that's actually digestible for like a person with an IQ of a hundred. I think you do that well, but actually getting into the idea of the trustless time chain, can you sort of explain that concept? Yeah. So um, for context about the book again, so when I decided to write the book, um, I was in Australia with a couple guys who had already left Blockstream, but they have contributed and one was a developer and all that stuff. And we were talking about potentially writing a better book, right? And obviously they have no interest in this. Like they play video games and like do developer stuff. Developers don't really write books usually. And I was like, oh, I should write a book about Bitcoin since like that's a cool thing to do as a side hobby. They voiced some concern and they said, well, good luck laying out the book because it's going to be impossible to put these subjects in any order. 
Mm-hmm. And it's going to end up the same way all the other Bitcoin books do it, which is like, let me talk about wallets. Let me talk about addresses. Let me talk about, and I was like, well, okay, well, we got to be able to come up with something else, you know, in terms of like how I could organize this that would help. Like my, the way I understand the world is through mental models. That's really helped me understand Bitcoin and a lot of other systems and just my life as a whole. Yeah. Then it was one of the guys who told me, well, have you ever heard about the time chain? I was like, no, I've never heard about the time chain. And I just like took notes the entire time he talked. And I was like, well, that'll at least be the first chapter. So the time chain and the idea of the time chain, I mean, it's basically about like why the blockchain is decentralized and or I should say not decentralized, but why it's trustless. So I call it the trustless time chain. Right? Yeah. And yeah. People talk about trustlessness and basically it's like Bitcoin doesn't use any third party for, for payments. You know, you could pay peer to peer. But what I didn't realize is that what it's actually doing in, you can read this in the subtext of the Bitcoin white paper, is it's not trusting a third party source of time, right? So payments need time because they need order, right? So if I pay you and then you pay, you know, our friend over in China, we need some way of knowing that the payment to me came before the payment to China. So then we know how much money you actually have available. Right. Okay, so we need time, we need order, but in order to be trustless, you need to not, ex- you, not you need to not trust any third party. So yeah. you can't use um, a third party source of time. So it does this by time stamping the original block and then creating a self-regulating system of time from that Genesis block, which like mind blown forever once I figured that out. Yeah. And then the, the, the process after really just wrapping my head around that was just drawing out the visuals and trying to explain it as best as possible. Yeah, like the self-regulating feedback loop. Is there even a name for that, for, for what it's they call a, that? It's called a feedback control loop. It's like a design. Yeah, it's, it goes back to the system thinking, right? Yeah. Developers talk in terms like this, but I don't think they're as visual. Mm-hmm. They just like yeah. speak it and then they get it. But for me, seeing the visual of the control loop, like basically... Um, because this is a podcast, I'll do it auditory, right? Instead of visually. But like, there's so many systems that operate on this feedback control loop where like you have mm-hmm. a, a thermostat is self-regulating, right? It yeah. looks at the temperature and it says, ah, oh, this is what the temperature should be. Turn on heat or turn on AC based on the temperature until you achieve the desired temperature. The blockchain does the exact same thing with difficulty. Depending on how many computers or how much hash power is in the network, you can change the difficulty to then make it so that the timing of blocks are always 10 minutes. Yeah. Right. And like, once you see that, you're like, whoa, like, like again, mind blown. It was just like, I don't think that level of understanding was really commonplace in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Like there are sort of like miners and then there, and then there's like people who are interested in the price and there's Bitcoin, there's people who are interested in economics, like, oh, Bitcoin's kept a 21 million libertarian coin. And I definitely fell into that camp for sure, like hard. Yeah. So it was it was interesting for me to break out of just the libertarian worldview and see a system for more than just that. Like I think Bitcoin was strategically designed to have a story around it. Yeah. Such that like libertarians would be drawn to it as a as the first wave of uh, consumers to it. Yeah, that's interesting. The feedback loop. It's it's just funny because that is such an important part. That is like the thing that separates it. Yeah, and, it is. <laughs> and, and like uh, no one talks about it. And sometimes no. I wonder to myself sort of. Yeah. Now I feel like a meme. And how no many one people talks about it? But it's true. Actually, want to know about it? Right? Yeah. Because yeah, it's true. You don't need to know about it in order to buy Bitcoin. No. No. I, <laughs> yeah. That, that gets to another thing about your book, about um, the potential reader, is that it's for someone who actually wants to understand how Bitcoin works. You have a big, I mean, you don't say knowledge is power, but you have a big section at the end about um, valuation and how important it is to have information to value something, which is like just tangibly, that's a great point. To me, it well, seems like that bold of the whole point of this okay. book I mean, is to help like, people value Bitcoin. I'm so, I'm so like, oh, I can't make any hard statements about valuing Bitcoin, but yeah. because people have to make that decision on their own. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But how many, how many times? Like, I feel like I've dedicated my whole life to working in this space. Like, write a book in my spare time, work at a Bitcoin company, try and promote understanding in the industry. But like, people in my personal life don't go and buy Bitcoin. 
they buy my yeah. book, but they don't buy Bitcoin. You know, it's like, there's sort of like, people don't get it. And I'm not going to go up to people that I love with a gun and say, you better buy Bitcoin because I love you. You know, like, that's, <laughs> not, that's not the right way to do it. Yeah. Um, I kind of wish someone would have done that to me, but that's just, I just have a fundamental problem with that. So yeah, yeah I mean, I end the book by talking about how value is created through companies and in capitalism, right? It's like, I think one of the big problems for me when I look at holding Bitcoin and moving into the future of like, if there was ever Bitcoin dominance is that, you know, with cash, there's inflation. And yes, that's a bad thing because it's, it removes the value of your cash, but it's also admittedly partially a positive thing. And like people's ears are bleeding right now. <laughs> I, say this, I know. Right. But because it incentivizes rich people to move their money because without yeah. moving their money, it will evaporate yeah. right so you if you have really wealthy bitcoiners that are like well i could start a company or i could just wait a year because then my money will 10x that is a halt in economic growth entirely yeah. so i so i hesitate to root for bitcoin dominance in that regard i think there's probably like even if you look at hayek he talks about private money and he says that the private money that will win out is the most stable currency Price stability. So the most stable currency, that's his prediction, right? He yeah. didn't predict cryptocurrency, but he did predict private money, which is pretty damn close. Yeah. And Bitcoin yeah. is not that. Um, it is deflationary after we've, you know, mined all the coins and then it just gets into a process of people losing them. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you hold Bitcoin, the what's the mentality behind that, right? Like I think for me, my experience has been, and I hold very little Bitcoin, but it's just like, I guess I feel like it's kind of boring <laughs> to just put it bluntly. It's like, well, now what? You know, it's not, a, you don't produce value by sitting on something. And that's yeah. actually a really psychologically tormenting thing for anyone who's creative or for anyone who's entrepreneurial, for anyone who wants to contribute. It feels like bad. It feels like wrong to just be like, well, I'm, I can't do anything, guys. My hands are tired. I have to just sit on my money until it grows. Like at least with other industries, you sit on a company that produces income. You sit on real estate that has rental income, right? Those things are contributing something to people's lives in the real world. Now, Bitcoin has its value. I'm definitely not removing that. Like, I think there are properties of the system that make it value valuable, but I think in order to be realistic, you have to realize that most people aren't using those properties. How many people that you know are using Bitcoin peer to peer, <laughs> you know? And like the killer, the killer, Pre like what would actually make Bitcoin really usable is if governments collapsed. Now I'm not going to advocate for governments to collapse. <laughs> you know, like that's so shitty. You know, like that would be, <laughs> that would be, that would be terrible. So, you know, in a, in a weird way, I'm, it's, it's been really hard for me to make that argument clearly because there's so many caveats. It's like, yes, Bitcoin is awesome, but like, please to God, let's still have some civil stability. Because yeah. It looks like that's sort of shaking right now. Oh yeah. no, stable. Yeah, okay. but it sounds I was like thinking you're bringing up you were saying like that you think that Bitcoin it to should be spendable too. exchanged more. No, I don't. So I don't make that. I don't think that that's useful for Bitcoin because, like, so one of the core arguments that I make in the book is that fees are going to have to go up, uh -huh. which really sucks for Bitcoin's usability because nobody understands why fees exist. Yeah, I feel like if people understood why the fees existed, they would be thrilled to pay fees. But instead, you get people like you know the Bitcoin Cash sort of team. At, like vilifying this idea of fees mm -hmm. because fees need to exist on Bitcoin. I really don't want to spend Bitcoin that much. Mm -hmm. And Peter Thiel said this, like, I think he started PayPal only after Bitcoin exists. I think that's right. But basically he said, you know, PayPal was actually trying to start a currency at the origin of PayPal. They yeah. failed at starting a currency and they did okay at starting a payment processing platform. Bitcoin is trying to be both a payment processor and a store of value. And it's sort of failing at being a payment processor. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like it could work with lightning. Like I'm really optimistic that it could work and that would change a lot of my views. But, you know, it's, it's really hard. Like it's hard because like, you know, as Bitcoiners, we're very adversarial to companies that are third parties and process payments. But mm. the amount of value that those companies actually add, like mediating disputes is a huge amount of value that they add. Yeah. Like, I think there's a space too where Bitcoin could improve for payments in a lot yeah. of ways and not, and not have to be like something that's like 
visa. Right. I think that's like a big mistake is that people compare the different transaction speeds, which makes sense just to understand uh, their proportion. But then they say, oh, Bitcoin's so bad compared to Visa or something like that. And it's right. Like, it's like you're comparing fish to monkeys. Like they're not yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Lightning is really interesting in that regard. There's a difference between belief and what you see happening, I guess. From what I understand is you believe strongly in the store of value as Bitcoin's, uh, or at least that's what you see now is like pretty much what people are using it for, which is like pretty obvious to me, yeah. I guess. I mean, I would make an argument for that. And I think like the way that I explain this, I don't know if I do a wonderful job in the book, but basically like I try and look at things as if I'm like a biologist, right? Like I'm looking at these systems as they're evolving. Mm -hmm. I try not to, because if you get, if you get into like, oh, I'm a Bitcoin believer, it makes you very tribal, right? Totally. So if I look at this, like, oh, like I'm a biologist, I'm simply observing what's happening. You can be a lot less judgmental and you can, you miss fewer things, I would argue. When I looked at Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, I mean, at the time of that fork, there were a lot of people who were not sure that Bitcoin was going to win out. Now, I was pretty sure, but like I knew people that sold all their Bitcoin for Bitcoin Cash. Prominent wow. people. Yeah, and we're because wow. we're in we're in bubbles, so we don't know. Yeah. And also people aren't likely to post that publicly because they don't want the hate. I bet there's politics involved in that too. Yeah, yeah. So people would tell me that in private and uh, it was shocking to me that that was the case because like as such a Bitcoiner, I was like, how could you possibly believe that? But to sort of explain what how I think about this, like I think about systems as like in, with this mental model as, as if they were evolving, meaning that when Bitcoin evolved, there was nothing like it, right? So there, it, it, it came at the, the crash of the 2008 financial collapse and it was asserting itself as a store of value because it was scarce. Now it's clearly very volatile, but it's scarce, right? And of course it's gonna go from zero to something because no one knew what it was. So you're gonna have a huge volatility there. But Bitcoin was also a payment processing platform, but it evolved where there were so many payment processing platforms. It was already competing with you know, the banks that do that. We have Venmo that does that. You could, you could argue that Venmo is sort of more peer to peer than Bitcoin. It's obviously not trustless, but you know, it's like, it, it has the consumer feel. So when you're, when you're looking at Bitcoin versus Bitcoin cash, it's sort of like, well, should Bitcoin be a payment processor? Because we kind of have a lot of payment processors that are better than it. Yeah. We don't have a lot of currencies that are better than Bitcoin. That's the core of the argument. Right. And you could do the same thing for the Ethereum community, for people that are interested in that. Right. It's like, how many different platforms do you need for smart contracts, bro? Like how many <laughs> do you need? Do you, if, is it like three good enough? No, you need like 20. It's, it feels like every year they're coming up with a new platform for building smart contracts. And it's because the systems are at least to some degree hard to update. So mm -hmm. when they get a better idea about how to improve the system, you know, Ethereum, it's, it's very difficult for Ethereum to go back and then just like change the entire way Ethereum is built, right? As we're seeing as they're trying to move from proof of work to proof of stake or whatever. So instead someone goes, well, I'll just beat you to it. And I'll like create a new smart contract platform and then I'll pay my customers to join my platform. And honestly, that's what Ethereum did with MasterCoin. Because I think it was yeah. MasterCoin, right? They were a, supposedly a smart contract platform and they didn't want to upgrade or they wanted to upgrade slowly and Ethereum beat them out. So it's like, Looking at the evolution of these systems is super interesting to me. Well, so like to see people just constantly trying to come out with the new and better thing, that's sort of like all cryptocurrency sin since Bitcoin is like, oh, there's some problems here. Let's make a new version of that. Right. Or like, let's address a new thing too. In valuing Bitcoin, how important is information to you? When does information stop being important? Okay, so I have a section in the book where I talk about like, how price changes, like any information can change the price of things. So now I'm looking about at this system as we're all a bunch of nodes. So like every human that knows about Bitcoin and is potentially gonna buy Bitcoin is a whole bunch of nodes in this cyber mind collective, right? Mm -hmm. When information hits the cyber mind collective, then we all go, oh, we should buy or sell, right? So that's the, the mental model that I'm thinking about this in. There's information like in the early days of Bitcoin, if one of the developers on IRC said the, said the term vulnerability or bug, you would immediately see a price change because it was almost as if it was automated to make trades based on future or potential reported bugs in IRC. Wow. Yeah, and like now it's totally different because now everyone's getting their information from different sources and like, one of the things we do at Blockstream is a data feed, right? So we do, you know, the, the fastest price information that you could get from all the exchanges. Certainly bots, you can set up bots to trade on that information, right? And like that's, I'm not making a criticism of that. I would argue that sentiment matters way more. 
Yeah, so you I can would look at things like news, like you can look at specific articles, but why bother when all of that is embodied in sentiment? Because the second a news article hits positive or negative, everyone's going to be on it, you know, like flies on a dead animal, like in, in on Reddit, or excuse me, not on Reddit, on Twitter. Yeah. So, and then I even was just reading this guy actually brilliantly decided that he would trade based off of the searches of Google. So you oh. could do like, he automated his trades based on Google trends. And it, I don't know, you know, when he bought and when he sold, but basically it was just like, if people were searching about Bitcoin and how to buy Bitcoin, that's when he would make his trades. That's interesting. Yeah. And, it, and he like, it, and it worked to some degree, right? Yeah. And there's a ton of different ways to do this type of stuff. Like, I mean, you could, you, you asked like what, how important is information or what information is potentially important? Like people who have a lot of capital could do arbitrage and make that really, you know, make that really profitable. But then eventually all, once enough people did that, you only need a couple, uh, you only need a few people with a lot of money to do arbitrage between exchanges till it's not profitable anymore. So there's a lot of different things. Like it, it's hard with information, right? Cause yeah. if you have a, if you have information about a vulnerability and you were to like buy or sell based or probably sell based on that information, right? And then you'd, you'd have to have the information and then, and then be the one to put that information out yourself and then no, and hope that that information translated into everyone in the collective taking the action that you want. So it's, yeah. it's like super hard. Yeah, and yeah. I, don't, I don't frame myself as a trader at all. Like, no, I know. But um, I do think it's interesting and I did interview some traders for writing the book and God, Thank God I'm not a trader because these guys are like reading numbers into like dice rolls. Like they, they, it's like they think there's synchronicity everywhere. Sometimes. Got a Ouija board. Out. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know that these two things are correlated, man. <laughs> um, God, that's crazy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just getting into the research interviews. Like tell me about the work you had to do for this book. Um, well, mostly I just had a couple friends who had a lot of time on their hands yeah. That happened to be Bitcoin contributors. So I would just like call them up and they were like IRC people. So they were always hanging out on IRC and we'd talk. Um, that helped a lot. I read a lot about mental models, systems thinking, watched a lot of YouTube videos on that. I watched a lot of YouTube videos of, from core devs that had like 200 views that no one else wanted to watch. <laughs> and then I would sit and I'd sketch it all out. So I'd watch, an, I'd watch something on, on YouTube, right? With 200 views. It's like some brilliant thing that like Greg Maxwell had spit out. And then I would sketch it all out onto note cards and then I would re-sketch it out on the note cards. And then I passed it to a competent art, uh, like artist that I met at a coffee shop. And I was like, can you please make my thoughts less ugly and then format that into the book? But yeah, I did interview some traders too, all like retail traders, no professional traders, um, unfortunately, which I probably want to go back and do. But I didn't get a whole bunch of like useful information out of traders, the traders that I spoke to. That makes like, sense to me. <laughs> I think they were interested. Yeah, they were interested in what I had to say about Bitcoin because a lot yeah. of the times I was like debunking their crazy theories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like it just seems like it, it has to do with like how you've like structured your book too. Like if you're just spending your time looking at the market, it's extremely chaotic. Well, yeah, you don't have all the information and you, you can't know. Like you can't know what's going to change, right? So if we look, if we contrast like a speculation with like maybe what would be like the crypto equivalent of like value investing, right? You look at the properties of the system and you say, ah, oh, like Bitcoin has a lot of infrastructure around it. It has a lot of wallet support, a lot of exchange support. It's the oldest. It's got the most people that are holding it. Like that's something that I want to back. And then you look at something that I find interesting, like Grin. Oh, this is even more private than Bitcoin, but it has like less infrastructure, yada, 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 yada. Right. So on that basis, you could say, well, maybe I'll, I'll put some money into Bitcoin, some money on this other cryptocurrency that like no one knows if it's going to succeed or fail yet. Right. But when you're looking at sentiment or when you're looking at like, you know, Twitter, you know, rallying, hype, noise, that's all immediate trading stuff. And honestly, most traders don't trade on sentiment. The ones that I was talking to from TradingView, like yeah. they're trading based on like support lines and resistance and TA lines. people. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were, they're like all just looking at the charts, which I don't do <laughs> because it's like way too complicated. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's more time consuming than you would think. And it goes yeah. back into that. What value are you creating trying to profit? Like it's not in my nature to try and extract profit off of like ups and downs or volatility of an asset. Like I, I like to create things. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's why uh, you do the podcast. Yeah. Wait, so uh, I was digging through your index and I didn't see, I saw that I don't, you didn't have privacy in there. And I, I felt like you've mentioned, you mentioned privacy, but you never really address privacy. I was curious because I figured you probably did, left it out intentionally. Yeah. So I, I think I want to write a sequel to the book yeah. that's called, uh, so this one's Bitcoin Clarity and the next one will be called Crypto Chaos. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, more provocative, right? People love shit that's provocative. But um, I think what I want to do there is talk about like different types of cryptocurrencies that are potentially interesting or even stuff that's going on in cryptography and then applied to cryptocurrency that's interesting. Yeah. You know, in order to do that visually in the same way that I did in this book, it's going to be a little bit more advanced. It's going right? to have to be if you're going yeah. to start talking about <laughs> cryptography and, yeah. and privacy. Yeah, like in, in order for me to explain even something coin join, but like visually, yeah, um, it takes like more of the page. So it's like yeah. I, I have to be more strategic about how I do it. And I do think privacy coins are some of the most interesting use cases for new cryptocurrencies just because there's stuff like because Bitcoin is hard to update, you know, you can't put crazy new shit in there. You mm -hmm. know, like you can't because people would reject that. So mm -hmm. you do have to sort of in maybe start, maybe the, the statement is starting altcoins is generally bad, but I don't know. I, I still find it interesting. Like it's hard for me to even criticize altcoins as bad because there's so many different things that people are doing in the privacy space that are so cool. And I don't know when those will, when the hive mind will realize that it's cool. Yeah. I mean, privacy is one of those things. It's kind of like insurance, you know, digital privacy is kind of like a new insurance that like a lot of people aren't aware of, I think. So I was reading this paper about the lightning network, actually. Hmm. And they, they use this term that was like really funny, which is economically irrational, which hmm. that's like a weird term because it makes perfect sense and is clear from an economic standpoint. But like anything that is not about like making money is essentially economically irrational. And privacy- Silliness. Privacy in a lot of ways is is one of those things. It's just like another, it's another human need. It's, it's not, it's just not an immediate incentivized thing, which, you know, yes. in a lot of crypto, that's what is working. Yeah. I mean, okay. So I'll say a couple things about this. So the way that I think about privacy, which isn't in the book and will probably be in the next one is you can implement privacy at the protocol level, or you can, you can have a system that requires users take actions that then generate them more privacy or produce them more privacy yeah. right so if you do things like you know not reusing addresses or all this stuff that everyone always says there's a bunch of things even if when you send bitcoin um, at the current exchange rate so if we're talking in dollars and then i send you ten thousand dollars worth of bitcoin at, a, at the time where that exchange rate made it ten dollars or ten thousand dollars that's going to be chain analysis is going to look at that and know that i'm in america and like know exactly what time I sent it based on the existing exchange rate. There's all kinds of things you can do on Bitcoin to preserve your privacy, but they're complicated. Really complicated. There are things you can do at the protocol level, which are more are complicated, not for the user, but then for the developers. Yeah. So yeah, like I think the other thing that I want to say about that is like my background, at least before I got interested in Bitcoin was studying economics and I would just listen to Mises Institute podcasts till no end. Like I credit them so much to my knowledge about, uh, about economics. And, you know, the reason why, like, uh, I think it was, I think it was Hayek, probably, I think it was Hayek, basically just the Austrian school in general. What they're really good at is understanding that like traditional thinking in economics doesn't take into account human behavior, human behavior. Yeah. So like things that would bother an economic, uh, an economist or a classical econo uh, economist is that if you raise the price of something, it actually increases the demand, right? And like, that's not what, how most, <laughs> that's not how most, that's not how most people trained in that study think. So when you apply that beha uh, human behavioral under understanding to Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, you have to think about like, well, what would be, it's so hard because you can't, it's so hard. How do you, what would be the driving factor that would make people care about privacy? Because for all intents and purposes, people don't care about privacy. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I mean, they should, we can, we can say they should all day, but yeah, but that doesn't not, matter. It, you, you get the re repercussions before you understand the value, I think. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And then you, it requires long-term thinking. Yeah. And we've never really experienced, I mean, we, we have seen instances in the past of, of how it's bad if you don't have privacy and you know, your data can be used and stuff, but we haven't had enough time really to understand like how important it is, you know? 
I yeah. Think. And I mean, it could be that it never is important in our lifetime. Like we don't know, like it all depends, even something like Bitcoin, right? When you speculate on future, on the future price of Bitcoin, well, that's all pretty much dictated by what the central bank decides to do. <laughs> if the uh -huh. central bank decides to shoot itself in the foot, then yeah, Bitcoin's really valuable. Um, and you can look at trends and say like, well, maybe the, the, like they have a history, they have a pattern and practice of stupidity. So they'll probably be stupid in the future, thus Bitcoin, right? But it's harder to do that for privacy because like it's, I just, it would take a lot in order for people to really care about privacy. But look at Bitcoin's initial use case with the Silk Road, right? That was when people thought Bitcoin was private, that was what they used. Yeah. And now like we have so many alternatives. Now, I don't even know if there's an alternative to the Silk Road. I don't follow that. I'm sure there is. And I'm sure they're not using Bitcoin. There are a few, but uh, yeah, everyone's still using Bitcoin. That's the crazy well, thing. That's insane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's insane. Thinking about how you as a user could improve your privacy by the behavior, changing your behaviors, or at least being aware of your behaviors. Like in Bitcoin, you know, I talk about this in the book, at least UTXOs. Like I explain UTXOs in full and how you make change how you can take a big UTXO and break it up into smaller ones, or you can take smaller ones and combine it into a bigger one. What I don't mention, which is the privacy side, is that if I'm like, if I'm looking, if I'm paying you, right, and I have a SegWit address, and you have like a multi-sig, mm -hmm. and I'm paying you off one UTXO and it makes change, well, it's pulling, the change goes back to me or an address that I control, which would be a SegWit address. Yours goes to a multi-sig. So at the blockchain, it goes segwit, multi-sig, segwit. You can perfectly see that which that the change address is mine. But I didn't think it was appropriate for this book because it's just going a little too deep. Yeah, yeah. And if you're like trying to understand Bitcoin, you don't really need to know about privacy yet. No, like I need first I need to make you care about privacy and then I need to show you how to be private. Yeah, yeah. Well, those are all the questions I have. I wanted to know where people can find your book. So right now I'm only doing the book on my website mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe we can include a link on this like podcast, like blurb down below. Yeah. I have getbitcoinclarity.com and I'm pre-launching the book on Amazon, but I kind of wanted to like drum up some support for it before I launched on Amazon. Cool. I think I'm going to go to Bitcoin 2020. We met at Bitcoin 2019. Please do. And I'm going to try to just give away the book there. Okay. Uh, for anyone uh, who buys a ticket to that. I haven't even talked to them about it, so I should probably talk to the organizers of the conference first, but that's yeah. sort of my plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> thanks for having me. It's actually fun to talk to you, so I think you, you actually have a really good show going. Thanks. I mean, there's so many people who are in the Bitcoin community who are like trying to say things, trying to explain things. I just thought you did a good job. You need Thank to be you recognized. So it really it. means a lot to me. Yeah, I really appreciate it because I did... I, yeah, just a lot of a lot of staring at walls and a lot of pacing was my process. So it's good to have it in the hands of other people who, especially people who are new to the space when the next hype cycle comes in, which maybe will be caused by the conference. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it did kind of coincide last year. <laughs> yeah, so if, if you guys bring in a whole bunch of people with all this hype, then I'll have to hit them with some clarity. That's the goal. Yeah, shit. I had another question I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you made a point about artists and scientists both look at the world differently. And that was like in the beginning of like the first section. I was curious about that because you're sort of, I mean, I think it has a lot to do with how you're trying to explain the book, how what you're trying to do with the book. Can you explain sort of how scientists think about the world and artists? Yeah, I'd love to. I'm getting giddy in my seat just thinking about it because yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, you care about the, the, the intro to the book. It's like super, it, it frames the whole thing, right? And I think what I'm starting to realize is because I think in long timelines, right? So long-term thinking goes both forward and backward. Because I think in such long timelines, I realize that the innovation that science has created, the ability to like go to school and study science, like the fact that we even have a word for it has really meant that a certain type of person goes into that field, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're good at writing, if you're good at being artistic, you go into the arts and humanities. And if you're, if you're left brained, or I know that sort of dichotomy has been broken apart already, but if you're more analytical thinking, you go into the sciences. And then even in the sciences, we grade people as to how, how analytical they are. So if you're really analytical, you go into physics. If you're slightly less, you go into chemistry. And if you're less, you go into medicine or biology. And this whole system to me, it's literally like we created a system to sort people based on how they think. Yeah. And it's like, when you look at history, that was a totally, that's a totally new phenomenon. Like I use Leonardo da Vinci as an example because the guy is a brilliant inventor and 
an artist. Like all of his sketches and diagrams are amazing. And he didn't have the words to separate and divide himself. And it's just sort of unfortunate that we live in a world that that requires that you sort of shed all of your artistic ability the second you decide to major in, in a STEM field, right? So I think that the way technologists, scientists, uh, even like business executives, the way that they think is so analytical. And I think our systems are suffering because of it. You know, not everything can be quantifiable down to numbers. It, it, it removes a lot of big picture thinking because analytical thinking is very small in, in its design. In order to understand systems analytically, you have to break them apart. So like our whole society, and it's hard to communicate how much, how much of this actually affects us because we're so used to it. But I think you know, how you integrate people who are artistic into, into the sciences is really, really hard because it, it <laughs> I don't know how you solve this problem. I mean, for me, I have a background in developing, but like I never went to school for it. I think if I had, it would have just suffocated me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I have a background in English literature, so, <laughs> but, but I, I agree with what you're saying, but like, I became totally fascinated with this kind of area once I just kind of had another way of going at it, you know, and I consider myself far farther on the artistic side than the scientific side. The actual trait, I think it's called trait openness. And then, you know, like when you look into psychology, there's different ways to, me to, to measure how creative someone is. Um, but, you know, it's like if you get a really creative person in, a, in, a, in an analytical field, you know, they can create innovation. But so much of it is day to day grind that it, there's yeah. just not a room, there's not a lot of room for creative thinking inside of building systems. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's pretty challenging. So yeah, I feel that I'm an artistic person. I, I, like I mentioned, I wanted to write fiction originally. Uh, I just felt that I had something to add when it came to Bitcoin because I had been working in the space for so long already. So that's what I did instead. But hopefully the goal, at least by us talking about this now, is to get people to understand that like just because your analytical thinking doesn't mean you can't like write poetry. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Just because you build systems doesn't mean you can't, you know, be eloquent or, or paint, right? And I think that trying to, to, to blend as much of your creativity into the things that you build um, is hugely valuable. Like look at Satoshi. Look at what he did with <laughs> creating a system. He took things that were not meant for what he built. Like uh -huh. he, all of his influence culminated in building Bitcoin, but it was like he took pieces that no one would have thought to pull together. That's creativity. And when you're, when you're really creative like that, it can be hard to describe what you're doing to people because you're building something that's new. Yeah. And like investors don't really understand that. So yeah, there's all, we have all these systems in place that are, make it difficult to be creative and to be analytical. But I hope that, you know, for people out there who feel that they're on, that they have both capacities, that they make the best of their abilities because it's definitely a gift. Artists go in the lab, lab rats, go outside or something. I don't know. Yeah. Talk to people, you know? Go to a rave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, anyway, thanks again for coming on the show. Uh, I think that's a good way to end it. The Bitcoin Magazine podcast is a BTC media produced podcast on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find us on Twitter at Bitcoin Magazine and you can find out about other engaging shows we produce by subscribing to our feed on iTunes, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.